Well, I'll tell you the truth. Well, you're probably not going to want to know me afterwards, but if you want to know, I'll tell you. We've all heard the term double jeopardy, and no, I'm not talking about game shows. The term has a fundamental meaning in law and is applied in legal systems all over the world. Essentially, double jeopardy prevents someone accused of an offense from facing charges and a trial more than once for the exact same crime. Because once you've been acquitted and found not guilty, that's it, right? Not so far a case ahead, Gary Allen was recently found guilty of two counts of murder, one taking place just a few years ago in 2018, but the first one, the first one had taken place over 20 years earlier, but he was acquitted and had gotten away with it. Or so he thought. Hello everyone and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. My name is Kevin and I really appreciate you stopping by. On this channel, I take a look at true crime stories while trying to pose some interesting thought-provoking questions. Now, just before we dive in, a bit of a courtesy warning. This story is about a murderer whose actions against women are consistently brutal. I source the descriptions of events directly from court documents to ensure both detail and accuracy, and sometimes these facts are uncomfortable in their violent details. So I just wanted to make that clear up front to all viewers. With that in mind, let's proceed with the story of Gary Allen. For this case, we go to Yorkshire, England. Yorkshire has a long and rich history. It is where the Romans and Vikings once lived, where medieval kings built their castles. There are a few sites in Yorkshire that are relevant to the story ahead. For the most part, we'll center around the River Humber, which sits on the east coast of the north of England. The towns and cities surrounding, Hull, Grimsby, and Rotherham, are worth noting. Our perpetrator, Gary Allen, will mostly live in this area during the two decades we track him, though he will also make one notable detour to Plymouth, which is several hours away by train located in the south of England. Allen will spend a number of years in that part of the country, though not exactly by choice. On the morning of the 26th of October, 1997, a Sunday, at around 10.30 a.m., the body of a woman was found by three school children washed up on the shore of the River Humber. Her body had been placed in the river at a site accessed via a street called Brickyard Lane. She was naked from the waist down, save for part of her tights and a boot which were both still in place on one of her feet. This body would be identified as that of Samantha Class. Samantha was only 29 years old at the time of her death. She was the mother of three and a very much loved daughter to her own mother. She had been working as a prostitute the previous evening. Some girls cut out for being a working girl. And then you get girls like Sam that sort of never really wanted to do it in the first place. Sam, all right. Oh, yeah. Oh, she's all right. She's with me, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, you say so. The way that he was chatting her up struck me as weird because he made it clear he didn't want to pay for sex. He was looking more as if he wanted her to be a girlfriend. Can I have one of them? I love them foreign brands. Exotic, you see, like me. Alan told police that during the night of the 25th of October, he picked up Samantha Class on Porter Street in Hull City Centre in his Ford Escort. He had agreed to pay her £30 for full sexual intercourse. He said he had driven to an area near Walker Street, which is also in Hull, and had sex with Samantha in his car. He claimed that the condom he had been using split. Samantha had become angry and, having put her stockings and underwear back on, left his vehicle and walked off. Alan claimed to police that Samantha left his vehicle unharmed that evening. He said he did not hurt her. The day after the crime, however, Alan would take some rather suspicious steps to cover up potentially incriminating evidence. Specifically, he decided to get rid of his vehicle. He initially claimed this was because he was frightened that the day after he had been with a woman, he saw a news report that she was dead. It's unclear if this claim can be substantiated as there is evidence that Alan took the initial steps to get rid of his car before the first news stories of Sam's death had aired on the television. Allen would sell his car to scrap dealers for £25 on the 28th of October, 
two days after Samantha's body was found on the river. The car had been registered as recently as the 3rd of October, just a month earlier, and he had purchased it for 50 pounds. So what was his rush to get rid of the car? Evidence indicated that Sam's body had been dragged from a car to the point where it was found in the water. The cause of death was strangulation by a ligature. 33 injuries, or groups of injuries, were noted. One injury to the arm was consistent with infliction by the tire of a car, suggesting she had been driven over by one. Massive internal injuries were additionally noted. The pathologist, Dr. Ruddy's overall conclusion was that Samantha had been the victim of a blunt force assault, following which she was strangled to death and then run over. Dr. Ruddy estimated that the time of death was possibly prior to midnight on the 26th of October, but it may have been later. There was no obvious signs of male DNA found in her underwear which was recovered from the scene, but semen from two men was found in her body. One of these men admitted having been with her some days before her death, but he was subsequently excluded from police inquiries. The second man remained unidentified, that is, until Allen was arrested for drunk driving in July 1998. At this time, his DNA came into the possession of the police. Allen's DNA would match with the other semen found on Sam's body. The forensic scientist's opinion was that her underwear had not been put back on after the most recent intercourse, and as a consequence, it had a bearing on the circumstances of her death. In addition, Allen was familiar with the area where Sam's body was found. He had lived on Brickyard Lane with his aunt when he was 16 years old. Of course, key evidence in the form of the vehicle present at the crime was not available, unfortunately. Regardless, the police felt they had their man and Allen was arrested for murder on the 17th of November, 1998. Gary Allen would be interviewed by police five times as the case was built against him. He would eventually admit to having picked up Sam that evening, but despite this and the other bits of evidence pointing to his guilt, the jury was not 100% convinced that they could convict. Allen was said to have lied his way through the trial, apparently quite effectively, because he was acquitted of the murder of Sam Class in January 2000. Local press commentary contemporaneous to the crime would describe Allen as a psychopath with a dangerous aversion to women. Similarly, a book written on sexual work and violence in the UK would quote the assessment that experts were making at the time. Warning to sex workers stated clearly that Allen would attack as soon as he was asked for money. This apt assessment would unfortunately bear out in subsequent years. In February, Allen moved from the north of England to Plymouth in the south of the country. Two attacks occurred in Plymouth shortly after Allen's arrival, one in March and another in April. These attacks bore similarities to what happened to Samantha Class in that they were brutal assaults upon female sex workers and involved strangulation. The first assault took place on the 29th of March, less than 35 days after being acquitted of murdering Samantha. Allen approached a woman who was, at the time, working as a sex worker in Plymouth. He requested oral sex and she agreed, however once they were in a secluded area, he grabbed the lady's neck, crushing her throat and pulling her to the ground with his hand. He demanded that he should not be charged money for sexual activity. He punched her in the head restrained her on the floor, and pushed his hand into her mouth. During the attack, he called her the scum of the earth. This violent episode only came to an end when Alan was interrupted by a member of the public. The woman was left terrified with injuries to her mouth, bruising, and scratches to her face. A couple of weeks later, again in Plymouth, he approached a second woman working as a prostitute in the city's red light district. When she requested payment up front, he put his arm around her neck and squeezed her throat with the crook of his elbow. He then dragged her backwards, as well as putting his hand over her mouth and fingers down her throat. Alan punched her in the head repeatedly before running off following the arrival of the police. Alan was located and charged with both assaults. On the 21st of September, he was convicted of indecent assault and assault occasioning actual bodily harm. And on the 8th of December in the same year, he was sentenced to five years and six months imprisonment with an extended license period of four years and six months. Allen was released on license twice. This form of release in England is similar to parole, 
in which a prison sentence is shortened and the individual is released, but with certain restrictions imposed on their movements and behavior. In 2003, during an interview with probation officers, Allen spoke openly about his mindset. The officers reported that he spoke openly about his strong dislike of prostitutes. He described prostitutes as being scum and the lowest of the low. Gary admitted to me that he planned and subsequently committed the attacks on the prostitutes in Plymouth. He stated that he targets prostitutes as they go with anybody. He stated that the pleasure of hurting builds from the planning stage. Prostitutes are easy targets. I just want to hurt people. Can't tell you how far. You know, I can't tell you what I want to do to them. I enjoy thinking about it. I get pleasure from the thinking. I just really enjoy different types of violence. During his time in custody, he outright refused to participate in any rehabilitation or sex offender treatment programs. Numerous psychiatric reports concluded that he possessed a high risk of sexual reoffending. While serving his sentence, Gary Allen admitted to the probation service that he had carried out and planned both attacks. He also said that the attacks would have been worse had he not been disturbed, and that he had not inflicted as much injury as he had intended given he had been drunk. He said he felt no remorse. Following his release, Allen returned to the Humberside area. Police, obviously concerned with Allen's new freedom, commenced an undercover operation dubbed Operation Misty, which was tasked to prove or disprove that Allen was in fact responsible for the 1997 death of Sam Class, regardless of his jury trial acquittal. They also asserted that the operation was necessary to protect both sex workers and the general public from any potential future violent attacks committed by Allen. Operation Misty would produce more than 400 hours of secret recordings to gather evidence. These recordings were made in part by Allen's new friend, Ian, an undercover operator with the police. Allen first met Ian on the 19th of October, 2010, approximately six months after he was released. Ian's cover identity was that of an experienced criminal who was on the run from other criminals having seriously wounded a rival. On the 6th of December, 2010, Allen confessed to the murder of Samantha to his new friend. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Well, you're probably not going to want to know me afterwards, but if you want to know, I'll tell you. The truth of the matter is, is that, you know, years ago when I was depressed, and I had sent you prostitutes about four or five times in a few years because of the depression and stuff. And I had sex with this prostitute one night, and the condom split. And she said, blah, blah, if you don't me, I want your name and I want your address, and your money and everything else, I'm going to tell the police you raped me. So I strangled her, and I dumped her in the umbrella. Yeah. Anyway, the police had DNA in that, but I went on the database. The reason I went on the database is because I'm never in any trouble. You know, I've not led a criminal lifestyle or not. So, anyway, I got done for drink driving and the DNA that way, and they arrested me and that, and I went to court and everything. And I just said, listen, yeah, I had sex with her last night in the, in the condom bus, but I was there as far as I was concerned. She went on her way and I went on my way. Obviously, I'm going to tell them true. No, I'm serious, man. I went to Sheffield Crown Court. I got found not guilty. And I had a mate living in Plymouth who I've since fell out with because his missus had him under the phone now. And um, the police were that desperate to get evidence that basically were interviewing everybody I'd known, even people I'd spoken to and stuff like that, because he had nothing on me. All it was was the fact that I'd had sex with her. There was well, no, because, I mean, that thing with that Samantha class, as I said, I told you about that, what happened there. The condom split, and she said, well, if you don't give me this, that, and the other, and you don't start giving me money and that, I'm going to tell the police you raped me, and I just flipped and I killed her and dumped her. But that's just the way I was then, you know what I mean? I thought, did you know what I mean? So... Gary Allen would insist his confessions were simply not true. 
He said later, conveniently, that the claims he made on these recordings about house burglaries, assaulting police officers, and the killing of Samantha were all fabrications. When asked why he would make up these stories, he said, I just wanted to pass myself off as criminally minded. The BBC would report that he aimed to big himself up to impress the hardened criminal. Apparently, he just wanted to sound like a tough guy to his criminal friend Ian, or so he would later claim. It is somewhat unbelievable, given this series of events, that Gary Allen found himself a free man during Christmas time of 2018. At this time, Allen was living in Rotherham, which is a large town in South Yorkshire. It was there that he would meet Alina Gerlakova. Alan was now 45 years old, she was 38 and from Slovakia, having moved to South Yorkshire in 2008 with her husband and four children. Her children were between the ages of 12 and 19. Alina was at a very low point in her life. She had separated from her family and was drinking excessively and taking drugs. To feed her habit, she had become a sex worker, offering herself to different men in return for drink, money, and even shelter. They had initially met in the summer of 2018, after which she visited his flat on a number of occasions. Alan had sex with her and gave her drink and other items. The last time that Alina would be seen alive was late in the evening of December 26th. That was on the same day that she had visited Alan's flat, uninvited, which Alan did not appreciate. The argument that ensued was recorded. I understand fully well you're taking me for a f idiot and I don't need it and I don't want you and I don't want this. No, listen, get the f out of my flat or I'm gonna chuck you out. No, I mean, get out! No. to my home and you've behaved yeah, and you've behaved like a stupid I don't want you here no I didn't ask you to come here I'm quite happy to be on my own for Christmas I'll give a get out my life go on and Elena if you knock on my door again I'm coming out here and I'm gonna beat the out of here I'm not kidding Elena's body was discovered over three months later in April 2019 in Rotherham Stream. She was partially buried and naked. Her head had been forced into an unnaturally extended position and her private area was exposed. Gravel or grit had been placed over parts of her body together with some stones. Alan had made efforts to cover and to conceal it from discovery. The investigation established that he twice visited the area where the body was left in the three months before it was found. Alina's body was in a high state of decomposition when it was discovered. Nevertheless, after careful examination by the pathologist Dr. Carter, it was clear that Alina had also died from a neck injury. She had been strangled, 
just as in the case of Samantha Class. Allen was arrested and would stand trial for Alina's murder. As this date approached, prosecutors made their move to finally seek justice for Sam as well, and argued to the Court of Appeals that Allen's previous acquittal be overturned, and that a retrial be instructed for Gary Allen for the death of Samantha Class, alongside Alina Gerlakova. So, wait a minute. Allen had stood accused against a jury of his peers in the Sam Class case already. He had been acquitted. Prosecutors are now asking for a do-over. Is this something that should happen? In the United States, the Double Jeopardy Clause of the Fifth Amendment is designed to protect citizens from their government. This sits alongside other Bill of Rights amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Basically, when prosecuting criminal cases, the government generally has greater power and access to better resources than a typical defendant. Double jeopardy keeps the government from using this power to harass a citizen through multiple proceedings and trials for the exact same offense. But what about a man like Gary Allen? The violent misogynist that refused opportunities to rehabilitate, repeatedly reoffended, brutally attacked vulnerable women without restraint or remorse, and over the period of decades. Well, the law in England relating to double jeopardy was amended in 2003. Part 10 of the Criminal Justice Act permits retrials in respect of a number of very serious offenses where new and compelling evidence has come to light. Previously, the law did not permit a person who has been acquitted or convicted of an offense to be retried for that same offense. The premise of this change is that if new evidence is brought forward, say in the form of DNA testing or, as in this case, an outright confession by the acquitted, that the interests of the public are best served by appealing for a retrial and finally seeking to achieve the justice and hopefully closure that the victim's family and friends deserve. Upon appeal to the court, the decision was made. It is in the interests of justice for a retrial to take place in the circumstances of this case, based on this confession evidence, in order to preserve the integrity of the criminal justice system, given the seemingly unequivocal admission of guilt by the acquitted defendant. A retrial, as a consequence, is necessary to establish whether there has been a profound injustice to the deceased. In June 2021, after a seven-week trial, a jury found Gary Allen guilty of killing both Alina and Sam. After the verdict, one of Sam's children, her daughter Sophia, would tell the BBC News Service that the death of her mother had left her and her family broken into pieces. She called Samantha caring, gentle, and strong. It took 24 years for Sophia and the rest of her family to receive their justice. At Allen's sentencing, the judge would highlight the grief caused by the crimes. He said to Allen, the profound and lifelong grief which has been caused to them by your wicked murder of their mother, their wife, their sister, or their daughter is almost palpable. Gary Allen was then given a sentence of imprisonment for life with a minimum sentence of 37 years in prison. So what do you think of the concept of double jeopardy and how it played out in this case? I really look forward to reading your thoughts on this one in the comments below. And thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next one.